going to go ahead and get started this evening. Welcome to UT Southwestern's Science Cafe. For our regulars, welcome back. And for our new guests, we are so pleased to meet you this evening. My name is Charlondra Thompson, and I am part of the public affairs team at UT Southwestern. On behalf of my public affairs colleagues, Joya Lang and Mindy Sass, as well as our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Christopher Parrish, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Science Cafes are online conversations where our speakers take you on a deep dive into science topics. Our format is casual and interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions and encourage and engage with us, sorry, during the program. This evening, we will be discussing the science of food allergies. And Dr. Parrish, more on him in just a moment. Before we, we begin, we'd like to mention a few technical matters. We are recording tonight's program and live streaming it on our UT Southwestern Twitter page. Please mute your microphones to help everyone's audio clarity, and please unmute if you are called on to ask a question. We encourage you to utilize the chat feature to list questions for Dr. Parrish. We will start a Q&A at the conclusion of his presentation. Joy, we will be facilitating Q&A and we are monitoring your questions in the chat box. Finally, just as a reminder, while we cannot answer personal medical questions, we would love to hear from you with your general questions. With that, to introduce our presenter. Dr. Parrish is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center. His specialist in pediatric food allergies and eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. He serves as clinical co-director of the Dallas eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease and eosophagitis program at Children's Medical Center. Joya is pasting his bio link for Dr. Parrish into the chat. Please click through and read all about his incredible work. Dr. Parrish, welcome to Science Cafe. And now, Dr. Parrish, the virtual platform is yours. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to thank you for the, this opportunity. This should be um, hopefully a, a lot of fun and interesting for everybody who's here. And uh, thank you for everybody for missing out on the beginning of the NFL season for this. All right. So um, I want to, with this talk, I, I want to go over a few things in, in general. I want I want everybody to kind of understand how we approach the diagnosis of food allergy. Um, and I also wanna really stress um, some of the recent changes regarding food allergy prevention um, and some of the emerging therapies for the treatment of food allergy. So the big question that I like to start with is what exactly is a food allergy? So we use a, the umbrella term adverse food reaction for any sort of symptoms that occur after you eat a food. So this includes what we would refer to as an allergy and other things that we would not refer to as an allergy. We often use the term food intolerance um, for those uh, symptoms that occur but are not due to your immune system reacting to the food. If your immune system is reacting to the food, we, in general, we call that a food allergy. Uh, most of the time when we're talking about food allergies, we're talking about IgE-mediated food allergies. The symptoms of IgE-mediated food allergies usually occur very quickly after you eat the food, within minutes to a couple hours, and the severity of the symptoms can ra range very widely. Um, they can be mild and limited to the, to the mouth and uh, lips and tongue or throat, and that can be more common in, in situations where there's cross-reactive proteins between pollens and foods um, that tends to be um, more prevalent in uh, older children and adults. Uh, and it can range all the way up to anaphylaxis, uh, which is a severe, sudden, um, potentially life-threatening allergic reaction. Anaphylaxis itself can uh, have a, very greatly in its severity as well. Um, there are other types of immunologic reactions to foods that aren't quite so straightforward, where it's not just 
IgE or allergy antibodies binding to the food and causing a reaction. Examples of those would be atopic dermatitis, often referred to just as eczema, or uh, GI conditions such as eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE. There are others where IgE does not play a role, and the most common examples of that would be um, things such as FPIs, which uh, stands for Food Protein Induced Enterocolitis Syndrome, which is why we shorten it to FPIs. Um, it, that is a delayed vomiting, usually in infants, um, after exposure to, to specific food allergens. Um, and the mechanisms for that are completely not mediated through IgE antibodies. Um, on the other side of uh, the umbrella term adverse food reaction lie those food intolerances. Now oh, they can't see us. Come on over. And um, we typically group those into uh, symptoms that are either due to inherent features of the food or inherent features of the person eating the food. So uh, if it's due to an inherent feature of the food, we would call that a toxic intolerance. And that would be, for example, Scombroid poisoning, that's when you eat bad fish. Um, the histidine in fish can get broken down into histamine as the fish spoils. Um, so if, for example, a, a whole family eats a spoiled fish, then they could all have symptoms that will mimic an allergic reaction because they're actually eating histamine instead of having histamine released as part of an allergic reaction. Um, classic food poisoning with bacterial toxins present in the food. Um, presenting with uh, gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea uh, would also fall into this category. And then there are other types of intolerance um, that can be due to uh, features of the host. So for example, if somebody has pancreatic insufficiency, they may not be able to digest the food well, and that may lead to GI symptoms, including diarrhea. Similarly, if you have a def deficiency of the lactase enzyme in the intestines, you may not be able to die. Uh, digest the sugar in uh, milk, uh, which we refer to as lactose, and you may have gas, bloating, diarrhea when you ingest those milk products. That is not an immunologic reaction and it's not a food allergy. So the basic pathophysiology of food-induced anaphylaxis starts with sensitization. And when we say sensitization, what we're talking about is the process that uh, leads to the production of IgE antibodies. So IgE antibodies are allergy antibodies that are produced after you have an exposure to the food, you have what we call antigen presenting cells that are a part of the immune system that show that those antigens to uh, cells called T cells in your body. Um, with allergic inflammation, there is a skewing toward what we call type two, or sometimes we call it TH2 inflammation and certain cytokines or chemical messengers, such as these IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, those are uh, called interleukins. Those are chemical messengers that then instruct um, the immune system uh, how to react to that specific antigen. So in food allergy, we get the skewing towards that type two inflammation. The B cells then start making IgE antibodies, which then sits on the surface of mast cells and basophils in the receptor, ready to go if you're re-exposed to that uh, allergen. So upon re-exposure, um, in this case, peanut, uh, the peanut allergens would bind to the IgE antibodies. That causes a process that we call cross-linking, which sends signals through the cell um, for the release of all of the, the chemicals that mediate the allergic reaction, things like histamine, um, and that leads to your symptoms. So IgE-mediated food allergy um, is mostly caused by a relatively small number of foods. These are the top eight foods listed here. Sesame is the, the ninth most common food. Um, if you notice, milk and egg are the most common in children. Um, but when you look at adults, it's really peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish that uh, predominate. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, milk and egg allergy typically resolve. A lot of the allergens in milk and egg are uh, heat labile, meaning that the allergens actually change their shape after they've been heated. So many children can tolerate extensively baked forms of milk and egg 
especially if it's inside of a wheat product, like a muffin, a cake, or a cookie. And those kids who can tolerate that tend to outgrow the allergy at a younger age. We don't really know whether that's because of feeding those foods or if being able to eat those foods is just a marker of a milder phenotype of the allergy. So at this point, I'd like to, to have a poll question for the audience um, related to food allergy diagnosis. So the question is, true or false, the best way to diagnose a food allergy is with a blood test, uh, specifically food-specific IgE testing. All right, so out of 50 answers, it looks like about 70% of y'all got it uh, correct. So that is not the best way to diagnose food allergy. Um, the most important thing when you're diagnosing food allergy is actually the history. Um, so the testing, uh, blood testing, skin prick testing, all of that is basically there to uh, support the diagnosis after you've taken a thorough history. Um, we really try and discourage the use of broad panel testing because it can lead to inaccurate results and unnecessary avoidance of foods. And we'll get into um, things about food allergy prevention a little bit later as far as how that can actually be harmful in some cases if you are unnecessarily avoiding a food um, that you may not actually be allergic to. So uh, we, we always start with a history. We, we uh, see which foods that children eat without symptoms. If they can eat the food with no symptoms, they are not allergic to that food, no matter what a blood or a skin prick test says. Um, now, as far as um, IgE-mediated food allergy overall, it's relatively common. So uh, it affects about 8% of children in the US. So that's about one in 13. So most classrooms in America will have at least one child with food allergy. The prevalence has been increasing in recent years as well. In general for management, we uh, identify the allergens through testing to confirm the diagnosis, and then we recommend strict avoidance of those foods. Um, emergency preparedness, including having auto-injectable epinephrine, um, whether that's in the form of a generic auto injector, an EpiPen, or an AviQ device, um, remains the mainstay. Uh, we like to have any child um, who has been diagnosed with a food allergy, who's had a history of anaphylaxis or any other systemic or whole body reaction, for example, if they had hives all over their body without other symptoms, that wouldn't be anaphylaxis, but we would still want them to have these. Um, epinephrine auto injectors available in case of accidental exposure. Um, and we always want them to have a written plan in place so they know what to do if an accidental exposure occurs. As far as risk factors for developing food allergy, um, the strongest risk factor is severe eczema. The worse the eczema is, the longer the child has had the eczema, eczema the higher their risk of developing food allergy. The next most important risk factor is actually having other food allergies. So once a child has reacted to egg or milk, they're more likely to react when they're uh, first introduced to peanut than a child who tolerated those foods with no issues. Mild to moderate eczema is a risk factor, though not as strong as severe eczema. And then family history of atopy. By atopy, we just mean family history of other allergic conditions. Um, is actually not as strong of a risk factor as one might presume, um, especially if you control for these other factors. So if you have a, uh, two children in a family, one has food allergy, the next child in the family isn't necessarily going to have food allergy. And if you take out the, the factors of whether they have eczema or they've had uh, reactions to other foods themselves, they're actually not at a, a, a very increased risk um, of food allergy. 
But that doesn't mean that there's not going to be anxiety um, when it comes time to introduce those highly allergenic foods for those children. So at this point, I'd like to go to the second poll question, which deals with food allergy prevention. So which of the following strategies has been shown to reduce the risk of developing a peanut allergy? Uh, maternal ingestion of peanut during pregnancy, maternal ingestion of, during breastfeeding, aggressive treatment of atopic dermatitis in infancy, early introduction of peanut in the infant's diet, or avoidance of peanut for at least the first year of life. All right, so the majority got this question correct. It's actually early introduction into the infant's diet. There's really no evidence that what the mom eats either during pregnancy or while breastfeeding um, alters the child's risk for developing food allergy. There's also no st strong evidence that breastfeeding at all um, actually alters the, the risk either. Um, Aggressive treatment of atopic dermatitis, we're going to discuss in the next few slides. And we're also going to discuss the early introduction of peanut into the infant's diet, which has very clearly been shown to reduce the risk of developing food allergy. So um, as far as preventing food allergy, we like to start with what we call the um, dual allergen exposure hypothesis. Um, and this figure here uh, represents our general understanding of why eczema is such a strong risk factor for developing food allergy. We think that um, exposure through the skin is actually the main route that these kids become sensitized to foods so that when they are then introduced by mouth, they end up um, reacting with an allergic reaction. And the reason for this is eczema starts with an impaired skin barrier. Um, the uh, skin barrier does not function normally in eczema. Many people think of eczema as automatically equaling food allergy. As allergists, we like to think of it as the strongest risk factor for food allergy. There's evidence that you can predict which kids are going to go on to have eczema from a very young age. There, there are studies where they, they measure water loss through the skin within days after birth, and they can predict which kids will have eczema later on. And that implies that there's a primary problem with the skin. And there have been studies that have identified specific genes associated with, with this as well. Um, so in the setting of eczema, you have that type 2 inflammation that I talked about before present in the skin. And if the, the children are getting exposed to, to food allergens that are present in the home, but they aren't eating by mouth themselves, then that exposure in the setting of that type two inflammation is likely to lead to sensitization and then allergy when they go on to eat it later. We think that if the child's first exposure to the food is through the natural oral route, that that's much more likely to lead to uh, the development of tolerance and what we call regulatory T cells, um, which downregulate inflammation upon exposure. So, with that hypothesis in mind, it's logical to think that if you could decrease that cutaneous exposure by treating the eczema aggressively, maybe you could alter the risk of that child developing food allergy. And it's also logical to think that if you increase that oral exposure early on in life, you may also be able to alter that risk. So the skincare approach has been looked at. Um, the largest study uh, to date on this was published just last year. Uh, this was a population-based randomized control trial, including thousands of children in Scandinavia. And they were randomized either to no intervention, aggressive use of skin emollients or moisturizers, early complementary feeding of peanut, cow's milk, wheat, and egg, 
or a combination of the skin care plus the early introduction. And this study showed no effect on the development of eczema by the age of 12 months. And other studies um, have also not shown uh, a benefit as far as preventing food allergy. So this is a, a Cochrane review. So this is, uh, Cochrane does systematic reviews or meta-analyses, uh, what we call studies of studies, where they look at all the studies that have been done on a topic and they try and, and look at where the overall evidence is pointing. And there's, the evidence that exists for this is very limited, but at this point, uh, the early aggressive uh, treatment of eczema does not seem to have evidence behind it as far as preventing food allergy. And just this year, there was a, a, a study published that actually suggests that frequent application of moisturizers early in infancy may actually be a counterproductive. At first, this is counterintuitive because you'd think that if you're, you're treating the eczema better, uh, that you may be able to, to reduce the risk and you wouldn't think you'd be worsening it. But if we go back to that uh, dual allergen exposure hypothesis, um, you know, if the parents who are applying the, um, uh, the moisturizers onto the skin of, of the child happen to have food allergens on their hands when they're doing so, they may be actually contributing to that process of sensitization through the skin. Um, this definitely w warrants further study, um, but the findings are pretty um, striking, as you can see from the uh, chart here, showing that as far as rates of food allergy by three years, the rate was significantly higher in those who were applying moisturizer multiple times per day. And this was regardless of the presence or absence of eczema in those kids. Uh, this isn't the final word on this topic. There are other studies ongoing. Um, specifically, there's a large study looking at the, the application of topical ceramides as a specific type of uh, moisturizer. Um, and we'll have to wait and see what that shows. So the jury is still out on this, but we can't recommend this um, specifically for the prevention of food allergy at this point. So coming back to, to our um, dual allergen exposure hypothesis, what about increasing that oral exposure early in life? So in 2015, um, there was a landmark study published known as the LEAP trial. Um, the idea for this trial actually came out of uh, observational studies uh, done by some of these investigators. They compared the rates of peanut allergy in children in uh, Israel versus Jewish children in London. So they, they chose the Jewish population thinking that the genetic uh, predisposition would be somewhat similar. And pretty much all of the, the children in Israel were using a, a food product called Bamba, which is essentially uh, a corn puff with peanut on it. So basically a peanut Cheeto. Um, they use that as a teething snack in Israel. And in London, basically none of the kids were eating peanut in the first year of life. The old recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics as well were to avoid peanut for the first year of life. Um, and the rates of peanut allergy were tenfold higher in London than they were in Israel. Um, and so they hypothesized that this was because of that delayed introduction versus the early introduction in Israel. Um, so they decided to test it. So this was a large randomized trial in infants age four to 11 months of age. These kids either had severe eczema and they defined that by basically the need for frequent use of topical steroids just to keep the eczema controlled. Um, and or they had already had an allergic reaction to egg. And they included kids who had um, negative skin prick test to peanut. They also included kids who had a slightly positive skin prick test to peanut, but who didn't react to the peanut uh, when they were fed the peanut. So um, we think of this as um, primary prevention um, in the group that had a negative skin prick test, meaning we're preventing even the sensitization and then secondary prevention. So kids who are already sensitized, meaning that they have a positive skin prick test, which implies that they have IgE antibodies to peanut. Um, and in both of these groups, there was a significant reduction in the rate of peanut allergy. So the peanut was introduced between age four and 11 months, 
and mm -hmm. was continued until age five years. Um, Daddy. Daddy, I, I, uh, can I, can I, can I leave the ball in here? Yes. <laughs> All right. I apologize for that. Um, Maybe go shut the door. All right. So um, where was I? All right. The um, skin print. Tablets. Yes. Go please. All right. So the um, the the skin protect ne test negative. So they were fed peanut three times a week in a large amount. So they were eating twenty one pieces of bamba. That's the equivalent of two teaspoons of peanut butter three times a week. They did that from four to 11 months of age all the way to five years of age. And then they did an oral food challenge where they actually fed them peanut to see whether they were allergic or not. And in the per protocol group, so this is the, if those who were able to follow that um, protocol the entire time, essentially nobody um, who was in the, the group assigned to eating the peanut ended up with uh, peanut allergy. Um, in the intention to treat analysis, um, it was an 86% relative risk reduction um, in the skin per test negative group and a 70% relative risk reduction in the skin per test positive group. So in both groups, uh, a dramatic decrease in the rate of peanut allergy at age five years. They then had these kids stop eating peanut for a year from age five to age six and then challenge them again. That was known as the leap on study the benefit remained. So that shows that this is different than desensitization. For desensitization to foods, if you stop it, most of those kids become reactive again after they um, have a period of avoidance. Uh, with this, this is true tolerance. So this is what people who aren't allergic to foods have, where they don't have to think about when the last time they ate the food was. They can skip it for an entire year, come back to it, and not have an allergic reaction. So the um, early introduction of egg has also been studied. And this gets a little more complicated. So there were four studies that, that were done that did not show benefit. Um, but if you look at this column here where it says form of egg, um, the three Australian studies and the German study all used raw egg powder. And as I talked about before, the allergenicity of egg depends on how it's prepared. The more it's cooked, the less allergenic it is. Um, one of the problems they ran into in these studies was allergic reactions at initial exposure. So a third of the children in the um, STAR study actually had, were allergic with the initial exposure. So you can't really prove that you can prevent food allergy when you have that many of the kids allergic at the start of the study. Um, those were high risk kids, but even in this standard risk group from Germany, um, they had a really high rate of anaphylaxis at entry to the study. Then there was a Japanese study that was published that used heated egg powder that actually showed that in high risk kids, you can absolutely reduce the risk of them becoming allergic to a egg and the number needed to treat. So how many kids you would have to introduce egg early to prevent one egg allergy in this group was only 3.4. So that's a really strong benefit. It was so strong that they actually stopped the study early. Um, the EAT trial, which is actually the trial that that application of moisturizer um, uh, was, was part of. Uh, it, it also, this was a study done in the UK by the same, a lot of the same people who were involved in the, the LEAP trial. They tried to introduce um, a larger number of uh, allergenic foods early on in life. And they basically proved that it's really hard to get babies to eat a large number of highly allergenic foods on a very regimented schedule. So in the per protocol group, it reduced the risk of peanut allergy and egg allergy. Um, but in the overall analysis, they didn't see a benefit because so many of the kids just wouldn't eat the foods on that consistent of a basis. Um, and then there was a meta-analysis that looked at all of these studies all together, looked at all the evidence, and came to the conclusion that there was moderate certainty that introduction of egg between four and six months reduces the risk of egg allergy. As far as cow's milk, we initially had nothing but sort of what I would call circumstantial evidence that early introduction of cow's milk may work. Um, there were, were observational studies, including one in Israel, that showed um, almost a 20-fold higher risk if you 
introduce milk around six months of, of age versus within the first two weeks of life. Um, there was a Japanese study that showed that your risk of developing cow's milk allergy um, uh, was about tw almost 24 times higher um, if you delayed or didn't introduce cow's milk. Um, and from that same study that showed that early introduction of egg worked, they also surveyed about milk consumption and there was a suggestion of benefit there as well. But none of this is conclusive. Um, then there's a Japanese study published just this year where they actually had breastfed infants. So all of these infants are breastfed. Um, they were allowed to, if they wanted to, supplement with milk-based formula during the first month of age. But then from one to three months of age, they were randomized either to um, supplementing with cow's milk once a day or um, supplementing with um, soy or no supplementation at all. And then they stopped at three months of age and everybody was allowed to have milk-based formula if they wanted, didn't have to continue it if they didn't want to. And then at six months of age, they did a food challenge. And in the group that was um, avoiding cow's milk from one to three months of age, the rate of cow's milk allergy was high. It was almost 7% of those kids were allergic to cow's milk at that point, um, which is high. If you look at the overall prevalence of cow's milk allergy, it was two to 3%. So that's really high. And then in the ingestion group, it was only 0.8%. So this suggests that um, something as simple as having the non-breastfeeding parent, for example, wake up in the middle of the night while the breastfeeding mom is able to sleep through the night and just have the um, the other parent give a, a bottle of milk-based formula from one to three months, something as simple as that might actually be able to significantly reduce the risk of a milk allergy. This is just one study, so this has not worked its way into any of the guidelines yet, but it's, it's interesting, and I would point out this is much earlier, one to three months of age. That's a lot earlier than the introduction of four to six months of age that we're talking about with things like peanut and egg. And for other foods, we really don't have a lot of um, information. For tree nuts and sesames, they basically did that same observational association that was um, noted between Israel and London with peanut, similar findings for tree nuts and sesame there. Um, and then that EAT trial, as I said for egg, it was only if they were able to follow the protocol. For the other foods, it didn't um, really um, show any benefit for those other foods. And some of the other common food allergens like soy and tree nuts and shellfish really haven't been uh, studied. So um, if, after the LEAP study, the American guidelines were changed to include early testing for high-risk infants between four and six months. So the idea was to get them in and skin prick test them um, between four and six months to try and facilitate the early introduction. Um, that is, there are some issues with that as far as the overall cost to society of testing that many infants at, at that young of an age. Um, and the evidence actually shows that it's pretty safe to just go ahead and feed it to them at, at four to six months of age. So this is the latest publication from earlier this year um, from the two American societies and the Canadian society suggesting that peanut and egg should be introduced between four and six months of age, regardless of the, the, the baby's risk status. Um, and really that testing should just be used um, if it's needed to facilitate the introduction. So if the parents would otherwise not be willing to do the introduction, then sure, go ahead and, and, and do the testing um, and do a supervised challenge if you have to, just to facilitate it. Um, but um, don't routinely test before um, introduction because that testing may actually end up uh, delaying the introduction while they're waiting for a referral or because the testing came back positive, even though they may not be truly allergic yet. As far as cow's milk, it, the suggestion is just to not deliver it with the uh, delay it, and same for any of the other foods. So these findings, th this is Bomba, this is that peanut Cheeto I was talking about before. This has led to an explosion of products that are out there as far as um, uh, being able to introduce foods early to um, uh, babies to try and prevent them from developing allergies. Um, now, I would say the, um, the, the Australian Society for Allergy actually had my favorite advice as far as early introduction of foods. And 
if we go back to that dual allergen exposure hypothesis, we think it's the foods that are in the home that they're not eating that the kids are getting sensitized to through the skin. So what did people do generations ago when we didn't have as much food allergy? They took what was in the home, they mushed it up or they, they blended it and they gave it to the baby. As soon as the baby started looking at their food with those greedy eyes, you know, that they wanted to eat it. Uh, so I think that's probably the best advice would be to take the food that you eat in your home, uh, get that blended, mush it up in a form that's easy for the baby to eat and feed that to them um, when they're developmentally ready and able to take the, the blended baby food. Um, these products definitely have a role. Um, you know, uh, blending food at home takes time. So it, the use of these may be able to facilitate it for, for um, some families, um, but they're, I, I wouldn't say that they are necessary in order to do early introduction. So as I mentioned before, the management traditionally has been avoidance and emergency preparedness. Um, but now we have some emerging therapies for food allergy, and that's what the poll questions three and four deal with. So this question um, is, uh, which of the following are recommended to maximize the safety of oral immunotherapy or oral desensitization to foods? Um, the options listed include avoid dosing on an empty stomach, avoid vigorous physical activity after dosing, skip or reduce the dose during viral infections or fevers, and avoid excessive heat, even something as simple as a very hot shower after dosing. All right, so it looks like we have a lot of very good test takers in this group. So when you see all of the above, it's often the right choice. Um, and in this case, it absolutely is the right choice. So with OIT, um, we're trying to feed foods to individuals who we know are allergic. And we know that there are many cofactors that can um, increase the risk of reacting by either lowering the threshold or how much food it takes to cause a reaction, um, or can amplify the severity of the reaction when it does occur. Um, and some of those factors include um, ingestion on an empty stomach, the food may be absorbed more quickly, uh, that may lead to, to higher likelihood of symptoms or more severe symptoms. Um, physical activity is a well-known cofactor for anaphylaxis and has, is associated with um, worse reactions. Um, viral infections and fevers, um, uh, when your immune system is in a state where it's sort of revved up by something else, um, that uh, can also increase your, your likelihood of reacting to a, a dose that you previously tolerated. So we typically would hold the dose or even if we have to hold it for too long, we may actually decrease the dose temporarily. Um, and then excessive heat, so very hot showers or you know, here in Texas, just walking around the block on the wrong day um, could be an, enough to, to tip you over the edge and, and have a more severe reaction. Um, so let's go on to the next question. So Palforzia is the first FDA approved um, product for peanut allergy treatment. True or false? The goal of therapy with Palforzia is to allow safe inclusion of peanut into the diet. All right, so um, actually this is the first question that the majority got wrong. So this is actually false. So palforzia is defatted peanut um, powder. Um, it was FDA approved uh, with horrible timing, basically right as the COVID pandemic kicked off. Um, but we were a participating site for um, the majority of the palforzia trial, clinical trials. And Palforzia uses a maintenance dose of 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams is about the amount of peanut protein that's in one peanut kernel. Um, so eating that amount per day 
uh, significantly lowers your chances of reacting if you have an accidental exposure to peanut. So we think that uh, most exposures to, accidental exposures to peanut are to um, a quantity of significantly less than 300 milligrams. And that's based off of studies, there's a, a, a lab in Nebraska actually that does a lot of study where they, they, they take uh, food products that have those warning labels on it and they actually measure the peanut protein in those products. Most of the time it's less than 300 milligrams. Um, uh, so typically if you're on a maintenance dose of palforzia, you're not going to react if you have a, a, an accidental exposure from a, a trace contact um, uh, exposure. Now as far as um, whether it actually allows safe inclusion of peanut into the diet, eating a, a complete peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something like that is not the, the goal of that specific form of oral immunotherapy. Um, and the reason why they chose that lower dose of 300 milligrams is because when it was looked at compared with higher doses of um, two to four grams of peanut protein, um, you get a similar desensitization effect, but you have higher rates of side effects if you push to that higher dose. Um, and in general, no matter what, if you're desensitizing to peanut, the majority of patients are truly just desensitized. That means that if you stop the treatment and then wait a while and try and feed the food to them again, they're gonna react again. They're gonna lose their um, desensitization. And as I mentioned before, that's different than, different than true tolerance. Now, there are some individuals who do so well with, with therapies such as this, they are eventually able to, to actually reintroduce peanut into to the diet, but that's not the um, specific goal of that therapy. Um, so we'll move on to the uh, next slide. So with the emerging therapeutics, um, obviously oral immunotherapy, we discussed palforzia. There are uh, absolutely clinics out there that offer oral immunotherapy um, outside of clinical trials and outside of palforzia. Um, we at UT Southwestern, um, we stick to the, the clinical trials um, and palforzia at this point. Epicutaneous immunotherapy is a, a different approach. So using much smaller doses of allergen, um, the dose that's been used in the peanut uh, clinical trials is 250 micrograms. So one one thousandth of a peanut um, and it, it's placed over intact skin. So this is very different from uh, getting exposure to eczematous skin, uh, which we think leads to um, sensitization to the peanut. If you're putting it over the intact skin in this very low dose, it actually um, can have a um, desensitizing effect. It has a much better safety profile than oral immunotherapy, but it's also less effective. Um, the, the company that uh, makes this patch product um, applied for FDA approval, but did not get FDA approval yet. Um, and we don't know whether they will get FDA approval. So that remains up in the air. Um, the studies for, for eight, kids age four to 11 um, were those that led to the initial application. There are studies ongoing in younger kids because we think it might be more effective if we do it at a younger age. Sublingual immunotherapy um, is an area that it, it's sort of an orphan area where th there's no, um, industry or, or pharmaceutical company that has adopted this um, and tried to bring it to market, but it sort of balances the pros and cons of oral immunotherapy and cutaneous immunotherapy. So it uses doses that are smaller than oral immunotherapy and uh, basically the patient would hold it under their, their tongue and then swallow. Um, and it, the safety profiles better than oral immunotherapy maybe less effective than oral immunotherapy, but more effective than epicutaneous immunotherapy. There are also biologic therapies, and the um, product here that um, is being illustrated is um, a, a medication called dupilumab. It's a monoclonal antibody that blocks two of those chemical messengers, that IL-4 and IL-13. Um, it's being studied um, together with palforzia for the treatment of peanut allergy. There are other antibodies that bind to um, uh, the IgE antibodies themselves um, so that they can't bind the allergens and lead to allergic reactions. Um, there's one called omalizumab that has been FDA approved for allergic asthma for quite a long time um, uh, and is now being studied for um, 
food allergy as well. Um, and in fact, that's a, a trial that we actually are actively re recruiting for. We're looking for, for children who are allergic to peanut and at least two other foods, um, either milk, egg, wheat, cashew, hazelnut, and or walnut, um, age one and up. Um, and this is you looking at that medication omalizumab uh, to see whether that can uh, reduce their risk of allergy. This study does also include um, one phase of it where um, the kids will be, would be randomized to uh, desensitization with the use of that medication to improve the safety profile versus um, the medication itself with placebo desensitization. So it's a very interesting study. Um, so I wanted to leave time for questions because I'm sure we're gonna have lots of questions. I think I, I hope I left enough time. I know we have a lot, but let's move on to the questions at this point. And so these are the voices you heard in the background. Um, <laughs> interrupting uh, when they came back from the park. It was the sweetest interruption. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Parrish. I am going to dive right into questions. Um, our first question comes from Dolores. She asked if you could explain the difference uh, between poll number two answers D and E. Um, so just as a reminder, those questions, the question was, which of the following strategies has been shown to reduce the risk of developing peanut allergy? D was early introduction of peanut in the infant's diet, and E was avoidance of peanut for at least the first year of life. Yeah, so E would be um, what the recommendation was in the early 2000s, um, and that would be not feeding peanut at all in the first year of life. That is associated with higher rates of peanut allergy, and that LEAP study that we went over definitively showed that doing the opposite, introducing it, early between four and six months if you can, and then keeping it in the diet three times a week in a relatively large amount can actually really lower the risk of becoming allergic. Got it, thank you. Our next question comes from Hope. Hope asks, are food allergies an autoimmune disease? They're not an autoimmune disease. Um, autoimmune disease is, well, I shouldn't say that they are not. So technically, Celiac is an autoimmune disease. In celiac, we would refer to as a type of food allergy. But when we're talking about IgE-mediated food allergies, we would not call that an autoimmune disease. In celiac disease, the, you are developing antibodies that actually target your own tissues. Um, whereas in IgE-mediated food allergies um, and other types of food allergies, you are uh, developing antibodies that bind the food and that binding leads to symptoms. So the, the allergy antibodies are not directly attacking your body the way that it, that happens with celiac disease. Because it is an immune system reaction, it would still be on the food allergy side of that umbrella term, but we don't usually refer to it as, as a food allergy. And most of the uh, classic food allergy examples would not fall in the autoimmune category. Thank you. Uh, my next question comes from Jennifer who asked, so exclusively breastfeeding increases risk of da dairy allergy? No, that, that's not what that, that showed. So um, it, they're exclusively breastfeeding does not alter your risk of food allergy. Um, early introduction of cow's milk may lower your risk of developing milk allergy. I wouldn't say that that's the same as saying that exclusively breastfeeding increasing your risk. Um, I would say that there is some evidence that if you can start supplementing just that small amount in that one to three month age range, you may be able to lower that risk. Again, that was one study in Japan, hasn't been fully proven. Um, so at this point, the recommendations are still exclusive breastfeeding for the, the first four to six months and then start introducing those um, complementary foods in that four to six month age range. Thank you for clarifying that because I actually was wondering the same thing. <laughs> um, from Grace, uh, Grace asks, once a child develops a severe allergy, is reduction of risk possible? For example, desensitization treatment. Yes, so desensitization is possible. Um, uh, desensitization has pros and cons. And I think the discussion of whether um, any particular individual should undergo desensitization 
is falls under the category of um, what we call shared medical decision making. This is sort of a hot topic in medicine in general. But I think this is an, an area where um, very reasonable people could come to absolutely different conclusions on whether it's right for, for a particular individual. So factors that I would look at when I would be having the discussion with a family would be, you know, if we're going to desensitize, how many food allergies does this kid have? If they have six foods that they're allergic to, including things like milk and egg, desensitizing them to peanut or cashew is probably not going to be as life altering um, as you might hope. Because when you desensitize to a food, you're only lowering their risk for that specific food. You're not making them less reactive across the board. Um, the um, there's other factors that I would consider would also be um, other conditions that the, the child might have. So kids with food allergy are also more likely to have other conditions like asthma, eczema. Um, they may even have GI conditions such as eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE, um, uncontrolled asthma or the presence of EOE would be considered um, contraindications to doing uh, desensitization to foods. And that's because uh, we actually know that desensitization can trigger EOE in some patients, and it, and it can also it, it would be considered unsafe to start a desensitization in somebody with uncontrolled asthma because their asthma may flare, and asthma is a risk factor for bad outcomes with food reactions um, as well. So it would just be a safety issue in those cases. Um, some kids do great with avoidance, and we, it may be that the, the, they're able to, to read labels and avoid it, or it may just be that their threshold is just high enough that those tiny trace exposures don't trigger reactions very often for them. So if a kid has gone the last five years without a single accidental yeah, ingestion and reaction, um, I would advise against desensitizing a kid like that because I know that the desensitization process is going to cause reactions in the vast majority of patients. It's, um, so we're, we always would want to weigh that risk versus benefit in that individual. Um, now, the percentage of um, kids who can then truly reintroduce the food into their diet um, and develop something close to what we would call true tolerance to the food I think is, is, is quite low. So another factor is the fact that if you're gonna do desensitization, you have to, to stick with a very regimented process with avoiding things like physical activity, heat, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it takes a very motivated family. Um, and then that the child has to continue that ingestion more or less indefinitely um, in order to make, maintain that benefit. If they stop it, most kids go back to being uh, as allergic as they were before. So that can be an issue for a few reasons. One is uh, that many kids with food allergies, they have almost a sixth sense uh, telling them not to eat those foods. So they have an aversion to it. So it can be a daily battle trying to get them to eat the food. You can try and mask it by mixing it with things like chocolate pudding. You know, if you're doing peanut, mixing it with chocolate pudding or um, applesauce and things like that. But um, it, it, it's not an issue in all kids, but in some kids, it can be a major limiting factor in, in how feasible it is to just stick with the desensitization long term. Thank you. Next question comes from, I believe it's pronounced Conwell. What is the optimal age to start OIT? So we don't really know the answer to that. There are, it, it have been some studies that suggest that starting earlier may be better. Um, so there was, in particular, there was a study that was done at Duke. So they named it the devil study, um, that seemed to show that really early, um, peanut OIT, um, had a higher rate of success. There are also some studies out of Australia using the combination of peanut and pro probiotics that had really high rates of success and actually higher rates of, um, what we call sustained unresponsiveness. So more of the kids were able to maintain um, their tolerance or their ability to eat the food after a period of avoiding it. Um, but that really hasn't been definitively proven. Um, and, you know, there are, uh, are other reasons why doing it at an older age may be a little bit easier. Um, you know, you can reason with an older kid 
as far as trying to get them to take the the the, the desensitization product regularly. Um, and they may be able to communicate with you better when they're experiencing a reaction and symptoms as well. Got it. Our next question comes from Jan and Tom. If the cow's milk intolerance is really lactose intolerance, then can it just be treated? So if, the, if, a, if somebody has lactose intolerance, your options are to avoid lactose. So there are um, cow's milk products out there that are lactose free. Um, other products like uh, yogurt tends to be relatively low in lactose and may be better tolerated because the bacteria in the yogurt metabolize the lactose for you. Um, uh, and then you can take um, uh, lactate tablets, which basically contain the enzyme and help digest the lactose for you. For example, if you wanted to have some ice cream or something like that. So yes, there are ways to manage lactose intolerance. Um, I wouldn't say that it can be treated, but it can be managed. Thank you. I'm going to take a few more questions and now I'm going to go out of order. Um, from Sydney, have any of your peanut OIT patients developed EOE? Um, me personally, I can't think of any off the top of my head who have. Um, there absolutely are patients who undergo OIT and develop EOE. Um, it's, the rate of that is not fully clear. Um, there was one meta-analysis that quoted at 2.7%, um, but one thing to remember is up to somewhere between 10 and 20% of kids who undergo OIT will have significant GI symptoms. Some of them you back off on the dose and then you work your way back up and they do fine. Um, others eventually um, do get an endoscopy. Others just stop the OIT without an endoscopy being done, so we never know whether it was triggering OIT or not. Um, so we don't truly know the rate that um, EOE develops. Um, there was another study um, out of CHOP that estimated uh, around 5% um, might have it if you were just basing it off the symptoms and trying to uh, predict which kids would actually have EOE if they had an, an endoscopy. Um, but there was another interesting study that was done um, in, with, between um, uh, Stanford and some investigators in Arizona as well. Um, they actually, in adults, they actually did biopsies in people without symptoms of EOE. Um, and they did biopsies before and then during um, OIT. And they found that in a food allergy population, there are some people walking around with elevated eosinophils there. And those numbers went up and down a, a bit during the OIT and didn't really correlate with symptoms. And for EOE, we, we really require both the presence of those eosinophils and some sort of symptoms of esophageal dysfunction. Um, so that just clouds the picture a little further um, as far as uh, defining how many people who undergo um, OIT will develop EOE. Um, in general, if we have a known diagnosis, I would consider it a contraindication. Um, but otherwise, you know, it it's, would be something that would be included in the, the risk discussion when we're discussing the pros and cons of the therapy. Okay, and um, one last question that I'm gonna take. We had a lot of really great ones. I couldn't get to all of them. Is from Eva. What are typical foods that people are allergic to in EOE? And the second part of that question is, could EOE cause poor nutrient absorption? So EOE, um, the most common trigger foods include milk, egg, and wheat. Um, Soy and peanut also can be triggers. Other foods that are less common food allergens, including meats, also can be EOE triggers. Um, EOE, by definition, is limited to the esophagus. So unless you had um, involvement of other parts of the GI tract, the EOE itself would not affect your absorption of nutrients. There are individuals who have eosinophils in, in the esophagus, but also farther down in the GI tract where nutrients are absorbed, which would be in the, mostly in the small intestine. If you have inflammation there, that could lead to um, uh, nutritional deficiency. Um, if we see nutritional deficiency in EOE, it's usually gonna be due to uh, e restricted diet, either due to pickiness of the patient related to the, the existing um, uh, diagnosis or 
due to the prescribed um, treatment if they're doing an elimination diet, if they aren't accepting of a hypoallergenic formula or aren't getting all the nutrients they need in their diet, it wouldn't be that they're not absorbing it, but if they're just not eating it to start with, um, that would be another reason. Thank you so much for answering all of those questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. It was fascinating to learn about food allergies and see how immunology treatment methods are transforming lives here in North Texas. Thank you to Joya and Mindy for helping us run tonight's event. We hope you'll join us <clears throat> in two weeks on Thursday, September 23rd for our next Science Cafe episode on prostate cancer, biomarkers, prevention strategies, and treatment innovations with Dr. Yal Loten. Be sure to register and we'll make sure to put the link in the chat. Before we adjourn, we, mo we must implore you and your friends and family to get a COVID vaccine. Vaccines protect you from severe illnesses and death from COVID-19 and its variants. For COVID information, including vaccine appointments from UT Southwestern, click on the yellow COVID info bar at utswmed.org. Finally, even if you are fully vaccinated, please continue to wear masks, social distance, and be vigilant with hand hygiene. Thank you for doing your part to contribute to our collective public health. And for now, we wish you all good health, good spirits, and a good rest of your evening. We are adjourned. <laughs>